Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Welcome to episode 254 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Have you noticed that there's an awful lot of talk about money these days? When we check into our favorite news outlets, we read and hear a lot about fluctuations in the value of the dollar, the pound and the euro or interest rates. We hear a lot about interest rates and who can and can't get access to credit. And then there are these new virtual currencies we keep talking about, like Bitcoin or Facebook's Libra. We talk a lot about money, but where did the idea of money come from? Did early Americans think and talk a lot about money too? Jeffrey Skolansky is a professor of history at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's an expert in the intellectual and social history of capitalism in 18th and 19th century America which means Jeff knows a fair bit about money and how early Americans thought about it. Now, Jeff's specialized expertise is why he's going to lead us on an investigation of the world of money in early America. And as we explore this fascinating world, Jeff reveals how money came about in early America, how English and British North Americans thought about money, and details about the money question early Americans grappled with, and how that money question informs how we think about money today. But first. Are you a member of the Ben Franklin's World Listener Community on Facebook? The Ben Franklin's World Listener Community is a place for people like you, people who love history and who want to know more about the early American past. The Listener Community is a really fun place. It's a place where we can all gather, chat as we have time, and a place where you can help inform our future episodes. Because it's within the Ben Franklin's World Listener Community on Facebook that Holly White and I ask you to submit your questions for future guests. Now, it's really easy to join the community. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the listener community button right there on the homepage. It's right on the top of the sidebar, so you can't miss it. Okay, are you ready to talk about money? Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is a professor of history at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's a specialist in the intellectual and social history of capitalism in 18th and 19th century America, and he's published several articles and two books, The Soul's Economy, Market Society and Selfhood in American Thought, 1820 to 1920, and most recently, Sovereign of the Market, The Money Question in Early America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Jeffrey Skolansky. Thanks so much for having me, Liz. I'm really glad to do it. Now, we're here to talk about money in early America, and this is a subject that Jeff knows really well. In his book, Sovereign of the Market, Jeff explores the long class struggle over the rise of money, not just as a means of payment, but also as a means of rule. So Jeff, I was speaking with one of my William & Mary colleagues the other day, Simon Middleton, and I was telling him how I had this interview coming up, and Simon noted that money has become a really hot topic in early American history. So would you tell us why you think that is? Yeah, I think there are a number of reasons. One, of course, is that money is a really hot topic in American society and politics right now. I think since the 2008 financial crisis, we've all been much more aware of the power of money and credit and the banking system in our lives. And even before that, I think we live in a time when we recognize the great power of financial institutions and monetary institutions in some ways more than ever before. That's one reason, I think. A second reason has to do with the rise of alternative currencies, currencies that work outside of the realm of governments and banking systems, things like Bitcoin and local exchange systems that have really proliferated in recent decades and have drawn scholars' attention to the distinctiveness of the kind of monetary order that we live in and the alternatives to it. And it has awakened curiosity about the history there. And then a third reason, I think, for an increased interest in, in money in recent years has to do with the history of capitalism, which is a field that I contribute to myself. And the history of capitalism, of course, has long been of interest to scholars. But I would say that in recent decades, 
scholars have focused their attention much more than before on finance and credit and monetary relations for a whole host of reasons. So those are some of the reasons I think that have drawn interest to the history of money in recent years. And what about the history of money in early America? What brought you to this topic? I've been interested in the intellectual and cultural history of market society for a long time. And an earlier work that I did focused largely on elites and the ways that they thought about capitalism and market relations in the long 19th century. But I wanted a chance to think about more vernacular popular culture and popular economic thinking which is very much preoccupied with questions of the monetary system and the monetary order in the 18th and 19th centuries. Early Americans thought a great deal about how money is created and how it's distributed and who controls it. So those things drew me to the topic. And then also, I was drawn to it from my teaching by what I thought of as a kind of cognitive or empathic challenge that my students and I both face in studying things like the bank war of the 1820s or the rise of paper money in the American colonies or the um, greenback crusade and the free silver crusade in the late 19th century. And that is that the issues can seem to us quite technical and arcane, but these are issues that were really hot button tremendously emotional issues for early Americans. And they were controversies that drew people in, ordinary people, people with little education who felt passionately about questions about the banking system and about monetary policy. I was curious to treat that challenge as an opportunity to think about what is it that enabled early Americans to relate on a visceral level and to wrap their minds around in quite imaginative and expansive ways to wrap their minds around what they called and what I've called in my book, the money question. So those were some of the things that brought me to the project in particular. Speaking of the money question, the money question was a phrase that early Americans actually used between the 17th and 19th centuries to talk about money. So would you tell us what the question was and what early Americans meant when they talked about the money question? The money question, like you said, it takes many forms and has many aspects. And I've had to draw out what I take to be the underlying issue that Americans are grappling with for a couple of hundred years, the money question. In different times and places, it appeared as much more particular questions like, should we have a national bank? Or should money be based on gold and silver or just gold? or Should Americans follow the example of Britain in having money controlled by commercial bankers, or should it be more popularly and democratically controlled? But underlying all of those campaigns and issues, I think, was a basic question, which was, what should we use as money, that is, as our means of payment and our standard of value? How should money be produced? And how should it be distributed or circulated? And who should control the means of producing the money that we all depend on? And that was, I think, a very basic question for early Americans that they treated largely as a political question that is largely a question about how they were ruled, how they were governed in a society in which people increasingly engaged in buying and selling and depended on market transactions, control over the means of buying and selling, the means of payment, became a core form of power. And Americans recognized it as a kind of power, a power that they could claim for themselves collectively, a power that they could contest. So what I'm struck by is that Americans argued about the money question, about what to use as money and who should control it for arguably longer and more deeply than any other society. And this it's something that you find in histories of money going back to ancient times. They all reference the American example, beginning with the widespread introduction of paper currency in the colonies 
and extending really until the rise of the Federal Reserve System in the early 20th century. The historians of money almost always recognize that this was a profound political question for early America in particular in ways that are distinctive and revealing. So the money question really encompasses a bunch of different questions, such as what should we use as a means of payment, how should we produce that means of payment, and who should control that means of payment. And all of these questions are something we need to investigate further. So let's start with the question, how did European colonists even come up with the idea that they should use money as a form of payment? Would you tell us about European traditions and use of money during the 17th century? Sure. In 17th century England, of course, we know that this is a society in which there was more and more buying and selling going on, more and more market relations, and there were great concerns about who controlled goods and how goods could be made artificially scarce and how ordinary people could try to regulate access to basic necessities like food and fuel. Well, money, of course, cash and credit figured very heavily in those controversies as well, because as English people were becoming more and more dependent on market relations, they were also more and more dependent on access to cash and credit. And in the 17th century, English people, when they referred to money, they meant almost always coin. But the great majority of their transactions were not conducted with coin. They were conducted on credit. They used actual coin usually to conduct exchanges with strangers. So as that's happening more and more, as people are buying things from strangers or selling things to strangers more and more, not just merchants or commercial classes, but ordinary people, the need for cash becomes greater. And they needed money for certain particular kinds of transactions like paying rent and often paying church tithes and paying their taxes. So in early modern England, there is a general scarcity of means of payment, of coin. The prices of basic necessities were rising. That's because there's more and more demand for those things, but the access to the means of buying them was becoming increasingly scarce, especially for poor people, because wealthy elites, merchants, and gentry and propertied classes were using the great majority of the available coin and also gold and silver plate themselves. So English settlers in America are coming from a society in which There's scarcity of currency. The coins that they used were a kind of a mishmash. They were largely unregulated in many ways. They'd use English coins, but also coins from other countries. And there was a lot of discussion and debate in England at the time of the early English colonization of America about how to increase the supply of cash and coin. And one way to do that, of course, would be to bring in more coin from abroad. Another way would be to develop substitutes for the use of coin. And in 17th century England, we see the rise of commercial banking and paper substitutes for coin as a general means of payment. So it sounds like the first English settlers in North America were used to not having a lot of money around because England never had enough money around. But how did they fix this? Kristen wonders how currency developed in English North America. And specifically, she wonders what kind of innovative ways the English colonists might have solved their currency problem. Did the English also turn to using everyday items like playing cards for money, like the French in New France? Right. So different groups of early Americans did different things. The majority of early English colonists didn't have a need for cash most of the time, even though they often were keeping track of their exchanges in monetary terms, you know, in pounds and shillings and pence in their transactions within their communities with their neighbors. They rarely needed access to cash. They would need it to buy land. They would need it to pay rent or pay taxes. Merchants had 
commercial instruments that they could use as means of exchange within their own commercial circles. For instance, bills of exchange. A bill of exchange was a way for me to pay for something here with credits I have over there. If I want to buy goods in Virginia and I've got money in London, then I can pay for the goods in Virginia with a bill, a sterling bill of exchange that entitles the Virginian that I give it to, to the use of my money over in London. And if she or he wants to buy something in London, then that bill of exchange would be worth something to them. So merchants had access to that kind of money. Ordinary people, as I say, didn't generally need a lot of cash for many of their ordinary transactions. But to supply the needs that they did have, one thing they did was to use commodities, you know, use goods that were in relatively easy supply locally. So that would have included playing cards in Canada, cattle, furs, oats, musket balls. Most famously, tobacco was used in Virginia. And Virginia actually set up a fairly elaborate system allowing people to use pieces of paper, warehouse receipts that were backed by tobacco in their exchanges. People also used coin. They had very little English coin in the colonies and actually exporting coin, sending English coins across the Atlantic from England to America was prohibited by English law. But they did have access to other coins through trade with other places like the West Indies and Southern Europe. And a lot of that coin was Spanish coin, coin that came from the Spanish Empire. And the colonies would decide for themselves how to value the coins from other countries or empires that they were using in their own midst. In other words, they'd give it a proclamation value to say that's how much in pounds, shillings, and pence here in Massachusetts we're going to say a Spanish piece of eight is worth. And they could do that strategically in order to draw in coin from other places. In other words, they could declare an artificially high proclamation value. They could say, we're going to make a Spanish piece of eight worth more in Massachusetts than it's worth in England, which would be a way of drawing coin into the colonies. So those are some of the kinds of currency that colonial Americans would have had before the big story, which is the introduction of paper currency at the end of the 17th century. Yeah, the big story. And we should talk about the introduction of paper currency because it really does sound like one of the first money questions early Americans had to answer was, do we need a currency? Now, I know from reading your book, Sovereign of the Market, that Massachusetts seems to have been one of the first colonies to really grapple with this question of, do we need a currency? So would you tell us how and why Massachusetts became the first English colony to emit a paper money and how Bay colonists really thought about this currency question? As it happens, it's the first, like you say, but all of the British colonies in continental North America, all the way from Newfoundland down to Florida, wound up developing paper currencies of one kind or another by the mid-18th century. But the first to do it was the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the early 1690s, right at the same time as England was having its own financial revolution and introducing the Bank of England and calling in all of its coins and re-coining them. So New England had a powerful and active merchant class, and it had a history already by the 1690s of experiments with local forms of payment. They had had an abortive experiment, a brief experiment for a couple of decades with their own mint. They're the only British colony to do that before England shut it down. They had experimented with plans for local banks where groups of New Englanders would agree amongst themselves to create a kind of paper currency backed by some valuable resource like land and then accept the paper that they issued as a means of payment. That wasn't something that was authorized by law. It wasn't something you could pay your taxes with. It wasn't something that served as legal tender for settling debts. It was 
something that would work just by a kind of compact or agreement. So there was some history already by the 1690s of New Englanders innovating. And New Englanders, for a variety of reasons, had felt the scarcity of English coin, the scarcity of coin in general, more than other colonies had. Colonies further south that engaged in a lot of direct trade with England, like Virginia, which was exporting tobacco, for example, they felt the pinch less severely than New England did. But that's all a way of setting the stage. What drives Massachusetts Bay to innovate paper currency, though, is what provides the stimulus for that to happen in almost all of the colonies most immediately, and that's war. As the colonies became embroiled, as they formed kind of the Western frontier for English wars against France and Spain and against native peoples, and the colonies sent their soldiers off to fight in those struggles, they needed a way to pay the soldiers and they needed a way to pay the suppliers. And they had little cash in their midst to draw on, little ability to tax themselves in order to get the money with which to pay soldiers and suppliers. So they created paper currency issued by colonial legislatures in the first instance as a expedient of war, as a way of paying soldiers and suppliers with the idea that it would be a short-term financial experiment, although it didn't turn out that way. It's really interesting to hear that it was more the government of the colony of Massachusetts rather than the people of Massachusetts that needed money. Is this what you meant earlier when you said that the money question was a question of money as a form of rule? That the government issues money and then determines how that money can be used and what it can pay for? What I mean by that is that control over the means of payment confers a great deal of power. Today, we live in a society in which the means of payment are largely controlled by banks. And that means that banks are exercising a kind of power, a kind of sovereignty over market relations. And I called the book Sovereign of the Market to highlight that that's what impressed early Americans, I think, most immediately about control of money. We tend to think of money in economic terms, and they thought of it in economic terms as well. But I think what they thought of most immediately was that it was a instrument of sovereignty so that if their own colonial legislatures issued their own currency, that was a form of self-government or self-rule, particularly because the assemblies that were issuing the currency included men of relatively modest means. And those legislatures were beholden to voters who were not wealthy elites the way that the people in control of the currency system in England were. So that's what I meant in calling it sovereign of the market. Now, as Jeff shows in his book, Sovereign of the Market, the emission of paper money in Massachusetts caused quite the conflict. And it's a conflict I really think we should explore in some detail. So Jeff, would you tell us about the Reverend John Wise and how he became a central character in the money questions of Massachusetts? I mean, how does a reverend become involved in the question of whether Massachusetts should issue a paper currency? Before I say something about Wise, who's a Puritan minister in Massachusetts, I wanted to make a larger point here, which is that we tend today to think of money and debates about money as separate from questions of religion and science and art and literature and law. You know, we think of economics as its own, in a sense, distinct sphere with its own discourse and its own kind of expertise surrounding it. Early Americans did not make that distinction at all. And in fact, I don't think early English people did either. They didn't think that monetary value was something totally distinct and different from other kinds of value and other values they had and other parts of their lives. And that actually is part of the answer that I 
came to for the question that I referred to earlier in talking about my teaching about how is it that early Americans were able to relate on such a visceral level to questions about monetary policy that can seem arcane and technical to us today. I think part of the answer is that they related questions about money very profoundly to other aspects of their lives, including in Massachusetts Bay, most importantly, religion. And John Wise was a congregational minister. He wound up preaching to a congregation in Ipswich, Massachusetts. His dad had been an indentured servant. John Wise was possibly the first son of an indentured servant to go to Harvard College in order to become a minister. And he spent most of his career embroiled in conflicts over power that were not directly about money. Two particular conflicts, one conflict that had to do with taxation and representation, and another conflict that had to do with power within the congregational church. And my argument is that the ideas that he developed about power and natural law in particular through those struggles over the power of the empire and the power of colonies in terms of taxation and over struggles within the congregational church, those struggles then informed his thinking and the thinking of many of his neighbors about natural law as it applied to monetary affairs. How exactly did early Americans relate questions about money with other aspects of their lives? Can you show us how John Wise and his neighbors used religion and saw religion as fitting in with this question of whether or not Massachusetts should emit paper money? Yes. And I would say that the arguments that he makes for paper money, which come late in his career and late in his life in the 1720s, they are made in, as you would expect, a religious spirit and voice, but they're informed by earlier conflicts about religious authority that are not in particular about money. He was very much involved. He was a central player in the so-called church's quarrel in the first decade of the 18th century. And this was a conflict over power within the congregational church. Traditionally, as we know, the local congregation in New England churches, it had tremendous authority within itself as a collectivity that is individual church members and individual clergy were much less powerful than the collectivity of the gathered church in a particular locality, like the church that John Wise came to serve outside of Ipswich, Massachusetts. But in the late 17th century, that power of the local congregation was challenged in a number of ways. One way that it was challenged was by demands for inclusion. You know, one kind of power that the Congregational Church had, a major kind of power that it had, was the power to allow people to enter the church. In order to enter the church, you had to pass a test when you came of age. You had to demonstrate to other church members in your community that you had had a genuine experience of faith and should be admitted into full church membership. And that's a lot of authority to exclude people both within their communities and, you know, exclude other congregationalists and also to exclude non-congregationalists like Quakers and Anglicans from the church. And being excluded had a lot of consequences. You generally had to be a member of the church before the 1690s in order to vote in your township. So, as I say, that authority was threatened in a number of ways in the late 17th century by demands for inclusion, demands to make it easier for congregationalists to be admitted either into full membership in the church or into so-called halfway membership, where you could partake in the church without being allowed to take communion. And there were also demands for access to political rights, like voting rights, for non-congregationalists. And there were efforts to empower the clergy as opposed to the laity 
in a variety of ways. For example, to have clergy ordained by other clergy by a laying on of hands instead of being selected by the local congregation. So all of those things came to a head in the first decade of the 18th century in this so-called church's quarrel over a set of proposals by influential church leaders, including Cotton Mather, to create regional councils of clergy that would hold a lot of power over liturgy and over church practices in local congregations. And John Wise becomes the leader of the opposition to that. It was called that Presbyterian program of concentrating power in the hands of councils of clergy. So Wise would have seen the issuance of paper money by the colony as a way to empower ordinary people by spreading money around and as a better alternative to those collectives of New Englanders issuing money, which you mentioned earlier. Now, where Wise framed the question of money in terms of religion, Dr. William Douglas framed the question of money in terms of science. And whereas Wise came out pro-money, Douglas was against Massachusetts issuing paper money. So Jeff, would you tell us about Dr. William Douglas and how he came to view money as an issue of science and why he was so against Massachusetts issuing paper money? Sure. So Douglas is a significantly younger contemporary of John Wise. He was a Scottish immigrant and he arrives in New England in Boston in the 1720s, near the end of John Wise's life and John Wise's career, and right at the time that major conflict over paper money was heating up. And Douglas was a leading physician. He had trained at elite medical institutions in Britain and on the continent, and he arrives in New England, a place where medical care is largely unregulated and largely handled by lay healers, as well as by clergy. And Douglas becomes a leader of efforts to empower trained doctors of medicine, physicians like himself, to give them power over medical care, as opposed to lay healers and clerical authorities. And one of the first controversies that he becomes embroiled in is a conflict over the response in Massachusetts and particularly in Boston to a major smallpox epidemic during which clergy introduced for the first time in a significant way the practice of inoculation. And Douglas vociferously opposed it. He opposed it, I'd say, not so much on the principle of opposition to inoculation. He imposed it because he thought it was reckless and unregulated and controlled by untrained and unqualified clergy and laity who should not be given the authority over people's medical care. And that's a controversy in which Douglas first made a name for himself. He goes on also to make a name for himself as an authority on epidemic diseases in the colonies more generally, and as a naturalist, as a practitioner of natural history. And it's from natural history, I think, that he draws a lot of his own ideas about what he would call the laws of trade, about circulation. Just like John Wise, I think, drew his ideas about natural law from his struggles within the church. And how exactly did Douglas's knowledge of medicine and natural history inform his views on trade and money? How does he come to advocate against Massachusetts issuing paper money? I'd say his experience as a scientist give him a arsenal of argument that he brings to bear on behalf of a powerful position. And the position is that money, like medicine, should be controlled centrally by elites rather than democratically or popularly controlled by local lay leaders. So in the same way that he opposed clergy and lay healers taking control of healthcare, he also believed that unqualified 
men of little means in the Massachusetts legislature were recklessly and unwarrantedly taking control over the means of exchange. And he understood, like his opponents did, he understood that control over the means of payment was a major form of power. And he thought that power belonged to the sovereign, that is, the crown of England and its royal authorities, and that American money should be very tightly tethered to the British monetary system. He thought it was okay for the colonies to issue paper IOUs basically as a short-term means of finance, basically as a way for the government to borrow in the short term, like, for example, to pay soldiers and suppliers in in wartime. But that should only be a short-term expedient, and the issues should not recur and renew and accumulate over time. It shouldn't be allowed for the colonies to produce an inflationary supply of currency. In other words, they shouldn't be allowed to make money so abundant that debts weighed less heavily. And that was a major concern he had. Douglas was a physician by profession, but he actually made most of his fortune as a lender, as a creditor. And he was outraged in particular by the idea that ordinary voters in Massachusetts could, by their own will, create paper money, a lot of paper money, and call it legal tender for the payment of private debts, meaning that they could pay him back and other creditors in cash that they were producing, that they were controlling. He thought that was, on the one hand, fraudulent. You know, it was a way for poor men to rob the rich, which was something he worried about a great deal. And he thought that he was economically disastrous for New England. So he becomes, just like Wise was a leading proponent of paper money, Douglas becomes a leading opponent, not, I'd say, of all paper money under any circumstances, but of the way in which money had become really an instrument of democratic self-rule in New England. Did Wise and Douglas ever have a chance to respond to the arguments the other was making on this question of whether Massachusetts should or shouldn't issue paper money? Wise and Douglas don't respond to each other by name. And there's a gap in that Douglas arrives in Boston at the time that Wise was heavily involved in one major political controversy over paper money. Douglas himself becomes very involved in paper money debates several decades later in the 1740s, long after Wise had died. So they're not responding directly to each other, but they certainly are responding to the opposing side of the argument. So what did Massachusetts decide to do in the end? I mean, we've explored how Bay colonists offered reasons both for and against the colony issuing paper money. So how did the colony respond to these arguments and what did it decide to do? In some ways, I would say they don't resolve. The British wound up essentially shutting down New England's experiments with paper money. And in the 1750s and 1760s, Britain is doing a variety of things to try to make the colonists bear more of the burden of taxing themselves and paying for the high costs of war in the American colonies, which up to then had ultimately largely been funded from Britain. And part of that had to do with the imposition of new kinds of taxes and quite significantly the stipulation that those new kinds of taxes had to be paid in silver. They couldn't be paid in some local currency that was being created in Massachusetts or Virginia. But also, in addition to imposing those new taxes, was wanting to enforce the power of its courtiers and its transatlantic traders closely tied to Britain by clamping down on colonial paper money issues, by mandating that they could only be short-term issues, and by mandating, most importantly, that they couldn't declare them legal tender 
for the payment of private debts, which is a really important thing. So that a wealthy creditor who said, you know, I lent you a hundred pounds five years ago could sue you for it. And you couldn't say, well, I have the right to pay you back in this paper currency that's actually worth less than the hundred pounds in silver that you lent to me. So Britain ultimately in the 1750s is moving to clamp down on these kinds of currency issues throughout the colonies. And that became a major source of popular discontent, particularly as the questions of taxation and who controls the money in which taxes have to be paid were closely linked. Supremacy of government, debt repayment, taxation. Jeff, these were all issues that were discussed and heavily debated during the American Revolution. So now we have to wonder, is there a direct connection between the money question we've been discussing and these issues that were later raised during the Revolution? Or, in other words, did the money question of the 17th century carry forward to help fuel the issues of revolutionary America? Absolutely, there's a direct connection. I mean, there's a direct connection between debates about control of money and debates about taxation always, because the money that the colonies created, the paper currency, was backed basically by taxes. What made it money, in a sense, like coin, was the fact that you could pay your taxes with it. The paper currency that the colonies issued, you couldn't cash in for gold or silver immediately, like paper notes in England could be. What you could do was pay your taxes with it. So that's how the colonial currencies were issued. And in the revolution, Americans then had had a couple of generations of experience with the close bond between taxation and currency issue. Another way to put it would be to say that a big way in which the colonial governments were able to pay for things like soldiers and supplies was by issuing paper money. And the paper money then could be used to pay later taxes, but it also meant that they didn't have to tax people in other ways directly in order to pay for those wars. So Americans by the 1760s are very familiar with the ways in which taxing and monetary creation are two sides, pardon the pun, of the same coin. And they see it that way when Britain moves to tax them without colonial representation and to demand payment in silver, a kind of money that they no longer could control. The money question, as you said at the start of our conversation, is a question that's still with us. So how does a better understanding of how early Americans grappled with questions of, should they issue a paper currency? Should they accept that paper currency to pay taxes? And who should be in control of the currency? How does a better understanding of how early Americans grappled with those questions help us address our money questions today? Well, I think it's important for the present time And it's also important because it changes the way that we understand early American history, I think, in important ways. In our own time, I would say the power to control the means of payment, the power to control currency and credit looms larger in in our lives than ever. And that's true in particular because of the enormous power of debt in modern America. And I think it's important for us to understand that these conflicts that we may be having today about the power of banks and other financial institutions over our lives are part of a very long tradition in American history. Americans have been arguing about the power of money lenders and the power of money creators really since the beginnings of popular politics in this country. So that's why I would say it's important in terms of the current day. In terms of understanding early America, though, I'd also say that I think there are ways in which the history of money has been understood in the past that have distorted our understanding of early American history very greatly, that have made the development of money seem like a natural, inevitable, inexorable pattern of progress from barter to commodities to credit instruments, rather than understanding the long class struggle 
over the institutions that control the means of payment. Now it's time for the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Now, Jeff, at the start of our conversation, you told us how people in 17th century England suffered just as much from a currency shortage as the people of ruling America, and that England, in an effort to help alleviate that shortage, passed laws forbidding the exportation of silver and other forms of currency from England to North America. So, in your opinion, what might have happened if England had not outlawed the exportation of silver and other forms of English currency to North America? How might the history of the money question have been different? It's a good question. It's a hard question. England had for centuries banned the export of coin. And in fact, for a long period, exporting English money was a capital offense. And for several centuries, it was also a capital offense, or it was a major crime in any case to export bullion, that is precious metal that hadn't been coined. In the 17th century, the English come to allow the export of bullion with a license from the king, but not to allow the export of coin. So really, the question would be, what would have happened if England had treated the colonies as being really just like Britain in the sense that although coin couldn't be exported from Britain, and that had been the law for centuries, what if Britain had said, we're going to allow coin to be exported to New England and Virginia? I don't think it's an obvious answer. My sense is that it would have made a big political difference if they had done that. I don't think it would have had a major economic consequence. The reason I don't think it would have had a major economic consequence is that the main reason for English coin being scarce in the colonies was not because England banned it. It was scarce in the English colonies because what the English colonies exported or sent to England generally was worth less than what they imported. That was how it was supposed to work from a mercantilist perspective. So I don't think that even if it had been legal to send coin to the colonies, my guess is that not a lot of English coin actually would have been shipped across the ocean that way. But it would have made an important political difference, I think, because the fact that coin couldn't be exported to the colonies helped the colonies see themselves as forming a distinct semi-autonomous monetary realm. It helped them see themselves as authorized in some ways to innovate and to create their own local currency. So when people like William Douglas in the early 18th century were arguing that all the power over money in the American colonies ultimately should be governed under the British system from England, what he was running up against was the sense that we have to create our own currencies here because the currency that England creates is only for English subjects over there, not over here. So I would say that had there not been that kind of restriction, had England thought of American colonies as being part of England in a way that would allow the export of coin across the Atlantic, I think if that had happened, the arguments for monetary autonomy in the colonies would have been weaker. I don't know that it means that the colonies would not have created paper currency, but I think it would have weakened the case for it. Are there money questions in your future, Jeff, or are you researching writing about something different? I'm not. What I'm interested in right now is questions about property in natural resources as opposed to financial resources. That is, I've been thinking about the forests of early America, and I'm beginning a project on how conflicts over the early American woods shaped 
American property relations in enduring ways, in the same way that long after slavery is abolished, we still have institutions like the Electoral College that are legacies of conflicts over slavery. I'm wanting to investigate how we still live with the institutional legacies of conflicts over woods and wildlife in early America long after the woods are gone or greatly restricted or diminished. And how can we reach you if we have more questions about money in early America? You can email me. My email address is sklanskj at uic.edu. I teach at UIC, the University of Illinois at Chicago. You can also find me at my faculty webpage in the history department at UIC. Jeffrey Skolansky, thank you for helping us better understand money in early America and the questions it posed for early Americans. My pleasure, Liz. Thanks for having me. Early Americans thought a great deal about money. They thought about how money was created, how money was distributed, and who controlled the money supply. Early Americans often thought about these money issues in terms of the money question, which, as Jeff noted, was a question that took many forms throughout early American history. Sometimes the money question was about, should a colony issue paper money? Later, it revolved around questions like, should the United States form a national bank? Or should the United States back its money with gold or silver? Regardless of how Americans pose the money question, the questions behind the money question have always been the same. What should we use as money and how should we use it? What are we willing to use and accept as forms of payment? And who gets to make those decisions? These are questions that we still ask ourselves today. They come up when we debate interest rates and who should have access to credit, or when we question whether or not we'll accept new currencies like Bitcoin or Facebook's Libra as forms of payment. And this is why Jeff thinks it would be helpful for us to develop a better understanding of money's early American past. Because many of the questions we ask about money today still revolve around the question of who should have the power to control credit and currency. And although the context in which we ask this question is different from the context in which early Americans ask this question, our question is part of a very long tradition. Which is to say, we Americans have been arguing about and debating the power of moneylenders and creditors since the earliest days of early America. You'll find more information about Jeff, his book, Sovereign of the Market, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 254. Are you a member of the Ben Franklin's World listener community? I hope you are. And if you're not, I hope you'll join us because it's a fun place to hang out and chat about history. Joining the listener community is really easy. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the listener community button right at the top of the sidebar. It's very prominent, so you can't miss it. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Kayla Pittman, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, what kinds of early American money questions would you like to explore next? I can't wait to hear what you're thinking about, so send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.